Okay, so welcome back and to part five of Beyond the Lyman. As I mentioned in the previous part here, we're going to be today looking at fears following on from the previous session where we talked about the concept of freedom and our inherent freedom and recognizing that and recognizing where you stand now in relation to your true self in all its beautiful non-contradiction and contradiction. And I mentioned there that at the end of the, the session, that what stands in the way is by and large fear. So we're going to be looking at what some of the great thinkers on this have said. And we're also going to be working with fear in the exercise. So hope you're not too scared because um, we want to be approaching this gently, you know, not aggressively, but at the same time, not shrinking away from it. It is by walking that middle way and gently assimilating fear that we can come to terms with the parts of ourselves that actually hinder our path towards greater self-knowledge, towards knowing ourselves well, and all the good things that brings with it. So with that all said, let's go now to a quote by the great German idealist Friedrich Schelling, a largely forgotten philosopher, but, well, in my opinion, one of the most important and powerful thinkers. He said this, he said, in freedom, there shall be necessity through freedom itself. And in that I think to act freely, there shall unconsciously, i.e. without my assistance, come to pass what I did not intend. There's many layers to this and it, it, it's sort of self-explanatory on the surface, but it actually goes very, very deep. And we could delve into this for quite some time. We're not going to, but in a nutshell, the fact that we have this innate freedom, I mentioned last time that one way of thinking about freedom is that it's the only thing that doesn't inherently contradict itself. It does contradict itself, it can contradict itself, but not inherently, because even when you use your freedom to violate someone else's freedom or your own freedom, or to be free of freedom itself and all that entails and the responsibility that brings, it's still because you're free to do that, that you're able to do that. So on a fundamental level, freedom there hasn't been violated. And so what Friedrich Schelling is saying here is that in exercising freedom, there is this law of necessity in that you cannot just make something appear out of nowhere in just the same way as, you know, all taught in physics classes that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred or transposed in something else in much the same way in exercising freedom we also set up an opposite or we create other consequences that must either must exist in order for our free will to be exerted or what we exert must comply with everything we already know to be true you cannot break truth it's by definition how things are it's the past is consistent with the truth. You cannot change the past just like you cannot change truth. And so we have freedom, but it must buttress up against limitation. It's quite simple on the surface, but it's this idea of necessity. So even though freedom doesn't inherently contradict itself in that sort of absolute way, it does nonetheless have a contradiction, and that is negation. It has something it must push up against. So in exactly the same way that everything that is born must die and you cannot die without having first being born and you ca cannot have up without down or right without left or conscious without unconscious or vice versa. Well, you cannot have freedom without negation, without limitation, without necessity. And here's where it gets even more interesting because in another place, Schelling also said that to achieve great things, we must be self-confined. Mastery is revealed in limitation. So we haven't talked much about Hegel. We've talked a bit about Hegel here, but not, not in any great depth. There's going to be a, a course released very soon, the Make It Conscious Philosophy course, where I go in a little bit more depth into how this sort of works at the back end. But um, essentially here, it is this very limitation that actually brings... The best of ourselves through. So in this sort of pre-wholeness state, I mean, when you're first born and you're a newborn baby, you have 
freedom in a sense, but you also have very little conscious awareness of that fact. You cannot really say that you're not who you are. You haven't realized your full potential, but at the same time, it's all implicit there. And you are who you are as a baby. There's no doubt about that at all. But you see, that's very different from this later stage of wholeness of this, as T.S. Eliot would describe as, returning back to where we started and knowing the place for the first time. Because we've been on this journey, because we've encountered negation and limitation along the way. So it's through encountering that that mastery is revealed. That's sort of pretty well understood. But why is that? And it's because in order to, to overcome, we must negate the negation. Don't worry if that doesn't make complete sense right now. But in other words, it's not about defeating the opposition or overcoming it in that sense, because that would also be to deny its freedom, right? It's about negating the negation. Sometimes that is what's necessary. If people in our society commit heinous crimes, the best thing we can do for everyone's freedom is probably to look, to lock those people up depending on you know, what it is they've done and so on. But in the, the microcosm of our own minds, what this means is that as we pursue freedom, as we go out to establish ourselves, postulate ourselves in experience, we set up opposition, we set up limitation, we navigate limitation in all aspects of our lives, and then we have to confront that and we negate that, that limitation, we negate the negation. So in doing that, we actually bring on board more aspects of ourselves this is how we become who we're really capable of being it's already there implicitly but we have to encounter it in the world and reconcile with it right again generally we're not looking to to defeat it in that sense we're looking to find out what is true to both that's what it's about it's about discovering truth because we come forward with okay this is my thesis negation comes and says hey you're sure about that i'm going to challenge you in these certain ways and that is what compels us to reach a higher order understanding. So it has some truth to it. It's not literally absolutely true, as much as our antagonists in this world would like to believe that was the case. It's nonetheless symbolically true, or contains some kernel of truth, as do we in our conscious stance. So when these two things meet, the idea is to find what defines them both and discard the mere packaging. So that's also what we're doing in active imagination here. So because of that, we have fear. Because in limitation, there is uncertainty, there is vulnerability, and we experience that in the form of fear. It's like, what if our postulate, what if our idea of ourselves isn't quite what we thought it was? And it never can be completely because the idea of self is sometimes just a self-image you know especially in those early stages of life or in the first half of life showing up as the persona nothing inherently wrong with that but buying into the persona and believing that is what we is well when that's called into question it's naturally potentially very discombobulating and is usually quite painful so that's how we have fear we confront fear and as Jung said Somewhat famously, where the fear is, there is your task. It's often translated a bit differently, but if you go to his letters, volume two, you can find it in there, written in 1956. Where the fear, there is your task. The fear points the way. And so then it's the will that we end up using here. We use the will to move us from where we are to where we understand we're capable of being. So this is like this implicit blueprint that exists in us and we connected with that last time in the part where we encountered the self the archetype of wholeness but i love this quote because it's, it's very simple and concise and it's simply saying look if you don't know what your task is look at what you're afraid of that is showing you the negation and it takes real willpower to move towards that that is uh really going against the grain it's the last thing we want to do often until maybe we come to some understanding of the macro process that's going on here. It's like what I might refer to as a meta lesson of the process itself. So with a bit of understanding there, it makes it a lot more feasible to use the will in that way. It's about taking responsibility for your mind, first of all, and then setting that intention to cultivate wholeness in yourself.
So whenever you're faced with a choice, you know, do I take the wholesome option here? Do I just take the, the option that gratifies the image in the, in the near term? Aim to lean towards the former, of course. doesn't mean you have to do everything right now and like conquer everything in one day, because the irony is that that's not the middle way. That's not actually facing your fear, because if we're trying to rush it, it kind of implies that we're, we're hiding the fear of it taking too long, or we don't want to be anywhere but where we are. See, that itself is to deny the wisdom of the self, because it's only by virtue of the self that we are where we are, that we're not experiencing necessarily complete wholeness all the time. There's also a famous quote by, ostensibly by Joseph Campbell, often quoted as, the cave you dare to enter contains the treasure that you seek. But as you see here, these quotes often aren't actually quoted correctly. They're often misattributed or slightly reworded. So it's actually from a, a book by a lady called Diane Osborne, and it's called Reflections on the Art of Living. So it's not clear if the quote was a direct translation, but anyway, it goes like this. It is by going down into the abyss that we recover the treasures of life. Where you stumble, there lies your treasure. The very cave you are afraid to enter turns out to be the source of what you are looking for. The damn thing in the cave that was so dreaded has become the center. So we're going to be using this as inspiration for today's exercise. Just a slight comment on that. It's interesting that the cave you're afraid to enter turns out to be the source of what you're looking for. Well, I think Hegel might have said, said it slightly differently. He might have said that the thesis is actually the source of what you're looking for, or the, the self is the source of what you're looking for. But the fact that we apply ourselves in a certain way is what sets up the opposite. Death is contained within life, in a sense. And death is really only a problem, potentially, from the perspective of life or that which wants to live. So the antithesis, the fear that reflects that antithesis or is reflected in it, is really only a problem from the perspective of what it is you, you regard as the truth or yourself in this situation or in this aspect of your life. So yes, there is something painful about fear and in an isolated sense, it is sort of inherently a negative thing, but it only exists in relation to how you put yourself forward, your beliefs, your desires and so on. So with that all said, you can let all of that go for now. And just setting up in the usual way. You can do this exercise seated, lying down, or even standing. Close your eyes if you haven't already. Just allowing the body and the mind to settle down. Could take a couple of deep, deliberate breaths. Some people find that helps. Or just do nothing for a few moments. And just gently increasing the effort by an increment or two. Bring the attention to the sensation of the breath. Just getting a general sense of the breath.
Perhaps you feel it more strongly through the nostrils. Or in the movement of the chest or abdomen. Choose a spot wherever it feels clearest. And just increasing the effort a little bit once again. Bring your attention to that precise spot. Just receiving that sensation of the breath. It's not even accurate to call it the breath. That's merely what we call it. See if you can just experience what is happening at that place. So continue in this way then, for the next minute or two. Just fixing the attention on that sensation of the breath. And if at any point whether during meditation or when engaging with the imagination, you get distracted. Simply bring the attention back to whatever it is you're doing. And just letting go of any effort now. No longer focusing on the breath. And open your mind up to the imagination. Imagine yourself in an outdoor space and standing in front of the entrance to a cave. And 
now. You already know that this cave is one that you are afraid to enter. But for now, just examine the place you're in. Observe the entrance to the cave. What is it made of? Is it natural or man-made? Is it wide or narrow? Are there any salient features adorning it or surrounding it? You could even just peer inside from where you stand. Even though you're not able to see deep inside the cave right now. You notice that the cave is dark inside. Before proceeding, also just examine how you appear in this place. You very possibly look much like you do today. Just notice your posture, clothing, and pay particular attention to how you feel at the entrance to this cave. So, you're now going to take a light and enter the cave. Before you do, just know that whatever you encounter inside is also some part of you. So, it may be scary, it may be powerful, but at the same time, just know that it is reflecting a part of you. It doesn't make the fear go away to know this. However, it may help just to give you a bit of faith that with this attitude and understanding and the effort that's involved, whatever you encounter not only can but will be assimilated sooner or later.
So with that said, take a light, lantern, torch or flashlight and enter the cave. It's naturally dark in this cave. As you stand close to the entrance, just notice if the path ahead of you is long and winding, or perhaps short and open. Either way, journey further into the cave and follow it to its natural end. Again, just note your feelings as you near the end of the cave's passageway. And as you do, imagine you're coming up to a clearing. And you know that in this inner clearing, contains the material you fear to look at. So when you feel ready, take your light and venture into the clearing. What is it you find inside? Are there objects, creatures, or another version of yourself? Take a moment more just to look around. No need to engage with anything in this space at the moment. Just observe it quietly. And just bring your attention to one object or symbol. If you feel capable, you could choose whichever symbol incites the deepest feeling of fear in you or that you find most uncomfortable to look at. But if that feels like too much at this time, you can choose an alternative symbol.
again, pay particular attention to how you feel at this time. And just as you would with the breath or an image, give that feeling your complete, undivided, bare attention for a moment. What is the raw physical sensation you are experiencing in the body? So now, I'm going to leave it to you to interact with this symbol. However you feel is necessary and appropriate. And also to the extent that you can manage at this time. You might speak with it, make contact with it, pick it up, engage with it, arouse those feelings and fears, engage with those feelings. You might ask it what it represents. How long has it been in this cave? How did it get in there? And what is it it needs from you? And likewise express what it is that you need from it. So just take some time now to engage with this symbol, however you need to, and in whatever way you can manage. Remember to use your will here to face and embrace the experience. Neither aggressively confronting it, or trying to make it go away somehow, nor backing away from it and giving in to the fear. So continue in that way for now. And I'll come back in in a couple of minutes.
So as this interaction draws to a close, you have the option to bring this symbol with you out of the cave. Or leave it where it is for now. You can always come back to this place in this exercise or unguided practice. For now, just make your way back through the cave passageway and back to the entrance where you started. Just allowing the scene to fade now and bringing your attention back to the space around you. Noticing any sounds or sensations. Take a deep breath if it helps. And opening your eyes again in your own time. So well done. Confronting fears takes bravery pretty much by default. Don't worry if you don't feel that you A, got to the bottom of it or B, got to it, but don't feel you completed the energy exchange that needed to occur. This is where the will comes in, you know, using it to approach that which we find uncomfortable. It's not the only use of will, but it's certainly a use of will. This energy and effort that's involved and it's through that interaction, it's through that awareness of the fear and the tension that creates and setting up against our conscious position, becoming aware of that and allowing that reconciliation to unfold. That's where the work is done. That's where the energy exchange happens. And that's where insights arise. Insight and facing feeling are really two sides of the same coin. You can't entirely do one without doing at least some of the other. So wherever we face feeling, there's insight that comes from that and vice versa. Wherever we come to insight, that leads to engagement with feeling potentially. So whenever you go into an experience like this, there is this understanding that is very helpful to bring in. It brings a kind of faith that even though you know there's work to be done and you cannot rationalize your way or bypass your way around fear. But at the same time, understanding that the fear has some corollary in your own mind and that you can assimilate and overcome it sooner or later. In fact, that it's a guarantee if you continue to apply intention and responsibility, then that helps you navigate the rest of the way towards its assimilation. But there's another little lesson here to take with us, and that's that Every moment you spend enduring a feeling, a painful feeling, a fear, is one less unit of energy and control that it has over you. So I think this is a great uh, fear that we have in modern society often. It's a sort of unstated or unquestioned assumption that pain is just a bad thing or fear is just a bad thing. This is reflected, for example, in our pharmaceutical industry. 
the idea that we just must numb pain. I mean, it's not entirely based on that, but certainly in the, the modern age, it seems to be becoming, if anything, more and more inclined this way. It's really like the, the packaging of health and medicine as opposed to the real thing, which is about getting to the cause. But if we just regard the pain itself as a problem, then numb the symptom and everything will be fine, right? Well, of course, that's based in a misunderstanding of pain and the energetic quality to it. And the fact that you haven't really lost anything if you have a headache for five minutes. There might be the assumption there that any five minutes spent with a headache is a bad five minutes. And from a certain perspective, it is. But we miss out that law of necessity and the law of compensation that Jung referred to. That actually, that pain exists in relation to something. And that going through that pain actually has some lesson, some insight. Doesn't mean we ought to just endure everything that's thrown our way immediately. Because again, that's also not only not the middle way and therefore suggestive of actually a kind of avoidance kind of avoidance whilst trying to look like it's the opposite of avoidance but also because simply the fact that sometimes trying to take on too much at one time actually leads to further harm arguably that's kind of what harm actually is that's what trauma is it's a surplus of what can be processed in any one moment and it's the tension that results from that it's one way of thinking about trauma it's one way in which trauma can manifest so with that all said, I hope you found that useful, nourishing, productive. Don't worry if you feel like there's more work to be done. I'd be surprised if there wasn't actually, if you didn't feel that on some level. But well done and trust that you did some work today and that it unfolded in just the way it needed to. So I shall thank you for your time and attention and I'll see you in part six. Bye.